I mean, than planned. <coughs> so I am Sacha Kagan. I'm going to moderate this session. I am from the University of Lüneburg and also from the international network Cultura 21, uh, Network for Cultures of Sustainability. So in this thematic window called Art Toward Cultures of Sustainability, we will be discussing together how the search for sustainability can be more than just a topic or an issue for artists, how it can be a wider cultural challenge to transform our minds and our practices. As you probably noticed, the title for this session, for this forum, has three key words. Ecology, the science and art of seeing relationships between systems and their environments. There is one ecology and there are many ecologies. Human ecology, ecologies of the mind, of ideas, of action, etc. Community. Human communities, neighborhoods, villages, the global human community on this planet, <coughs> but also communities of humans and non-humans. Aesthetics. The intense experience we can have in everyday life that unites our affectivity and our values, that fosters sensibilities to the world around us. To explore dynamic relations between those three keywords, we have two verbs in the title for this forum right now. Connecting. This is not just to say that everything is connected to everything else, which would be rather wrong, but yes, there are many, many connections in our world, many relations, as ecology shows us. And aesthetics can be connective aesthetics. And catalyzing. Well, this is about the aesthetic potential for social transformations in communities and at many different levels. I will not let you wait much further. I wanted to make this only this very short introduction. And now I will just say a few words, very few, about our three speakers. Our first speaker, Michelangelo Pistoletto, whom, if you did not know already about his work, you discovered uh, today at the earlier session in the plenary, who is known from his work from Arte Povera to the Città dell'Arte. Our second speaker, Davide Bocchi, I mean, the most far away from me in, in here, but very close to me as a friend. Uh, Davide Brocchi, Brocchi is a cultural scientist, a journalist, a cultural activist, founder of Cultura Attack and of Cultura 21. He's also a lecturer at the Leuphana University in Lüneburg, at the College of Bochum, the EcoSign Academy for Design in Cologne, among others. Our third speaker, Shelley Sachs, is an interdisciplinary artist working internationally in the field of connective practices and social sculpture. Her work includes site works, installations, social sculpture projects, involvement in grassroots organizations, and cooperatives. And she also collaborated with Joseph Boyce. She is the director of the Social Sculpture Research, in, uh, Research Unit at the Oxford Brookes University in the UK. So now I will leave the floor to our first speaker, Michelangelo Pistoletto. I just try to make the thing work. Uh, 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 I hate Windows. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a user of Linux. Uh, maybe. You 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 have to to introduce no to say some some question to me or I go on by myself. 
I go by myself. <laughs> okay, no question. Uh, what you will see, what you see there on the images, it is uh, uh, one sign, it's one, one form that is, a rep that is produced in many, 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 many different ways. With, with different medias, with different, in different situations, in, in different relations, uh, and so on. And it is called, it is called the sign, the new sign of infinity. The sign of infinity is made with two circle, um, and this is made with three, three circle, um, and it's representing. <coughs> The, the, what, what I, uh, I call the third paradise. <clears throat> this morning was, was, I was saying something about spirituality, but in this case you will see uh, that uh, spirituality is something that is not related with uh, the outside of, of, the, of, the, of the hurt, outside of, of, the, of the physical life, but is, is con conceived the paradise is conceived in, in, the, in the hurt. It is the hurt paradise. Why the third paradise? Because the first one, it was the one where the humanity, it was the, the man was totally englo englobed, totally in, in integrated in the nature. Uh, at a certain moment, um, it, start, it started to exist another paradise that arrives today, today a, 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 a kind of um, extreme point. I don't say the conclusion, but the, an extreme point that is the artificial paradise. The capacity of human being to, to escape the nature and, and little by little creating its own artificial method of life that in the last uh, century it, it became really a right to, to, to a top of, of results, fantastic results, and problematic, enormous problematic condition uh, on, the, on the earth, on the planet. So the third paradise, it is something that should start now, from the future, and that is capa the capacity of putting together artificial and nature, artificiality and nature. That means uh, that means the 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 capacity of uh, using science, technology, uh, social organization, in order to have a re reconnection, a strong reconnection, uh, re recon, um, uh, with, with the nature. We have, if we like, if we like, um, uh, if we like um, to go on with science. If we like science, if we love science, if, if because we, human beings are curious, need need something to go on in the research that is the science, we need today make uh, to create the possibility of of the science to survive through human being. If the human being does disappear, science disappear. I, uh, if I don't, I, I don't do it for human being. But if I do it for the science, I have to protect the human being. And if, in order to do that, in order to do that, uh, I think that the science has to become very conservative. Not in the sense, in the old sense of of being conservative, in the sense of being being going back to 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 the past system, but to to preserve, conservare, uh, preserve humanity. And this is this is why I think. A lot of work has to be done in a scientific way. I think that the research should really go through an, a big new engagement for, for saving, saving the, um, the, the human being. Of course, human being, it will be saved if, if we save the, pla the planet. Uh, this is a, a series of consequences that, consequence that it will, uh, we, we will have to take care. The idea of the third paradise is that from, uh, from now we have to have a common conception in the world that uh, we, we, we take, the, in, each individual take responsibility in a political way, as it was said this morning, 
before, but but um, but it is necessary also to have the tools, to have the the practical uh, the, the practical tools in order to achieve that. And we have to produce tools. We have to produce systems to for 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 a real practical transformation. We we are. We are very much related with the economy. We are very much related w with the, the politics. We see that the politics, they cannot escape the traditional economy. This is, this is something basic. We, we, have, we have a pyramidal, a pyramidal conception of the power. We, we, have, we, have, we, are, we are far from from the the, uh, the democracy as a system, a universal system, but we we cannot just just um, make a fight in order to in order to have a result. We have to create tools um, that are during and after the fight offer the possibility to all the the, the, the people of the society to, to to be able to participate to to uh, condividere to uh, par, uh, share to share project responsibility and, and and for that I think and in what Cita dell'arte is trying to do it is to make a work that it, it, it can be conceived as a school of capacity of not j just uh, reacting but reacting Re producing producing something Ca that can be useful. Mm, producing, producing, and, and um, uh, I mean, uh, making proposals and not just uh, revolt, because the revolt is going on. Now we need also somebody able to <laughs> to, to to go to the people, to go around the, with the people of the revolt, and 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 teaching them how to be uh, able to uh, make a governance. Because other way we will see that the, the old system of the governance will always take advantage of, of the revolt, and that, and that is what I am very scared that this will be will happen in, in the Mediterranean areas, and that and it is why I speak about about the the problem the problem of religions, because the religion are. They have century of capacity, mil, 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 millinery capacity of organizing people, or organizing and structurize and, and limitate the, the individual uh, brain of the people. And, and uh, we have to free the people from, from that uh, crust of th what they call spirituality. But it's, it's not what art think spirituality can be. Art thinks that spirituality, it can be freedom, it can be capacity of the individual to make the brain working, to be confront, to confronting, to confront individual and society, one by one, ten by ten, twenty by one, and, and so on. The, the, the big encounters are important, but uh, with goals, with 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 a kind of comp common comprehension, but also it is necessary. And what we do there in Città dell'Arte is the University of Ideas is to have a school, to have a school of capacities, not not just not just because I, I know I know if you revolt yourself against somebody, you you ask you ask the solution to them. And if they don't work, why you, you wait for a solution from them? You have to produce yourself the, the solution. This is democracy. We, but this, there is no school for that. We have to make an international world school of uh, autonomous capacity of the society. So to share con uh, knowledge, sharing knowledge. I was invited with, with Cita dell'Arte in, in, uh, uh, in Bordeaux, from the mayor of Bordeaux. Uh, to make to make uh, uh, evento that was the Biennale. The, 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 this is the second year of the Biennale. I was invited as an artist uh, with my with, with, with the group of, of my uh, my friends, and um, we, we we invited artists able to be, to come there and connect to the people, and we create and, and we create and we involve. 
in, in Bordeaux, 250 associations. The, an association brings a, a certain number of people together. But if you, you, if you have 250 associations, you have almost the entire city. And, then, and, and, you, you, and you make performances, and you make, create places where they can meet and, and, and make program to, to work in connection. And after, they feel not only being, being involved in technical polit political concept of co connection, but in a very emotional also way to be uh, to be um, uh, directly involved uh, between between each other, between each other, and, and, and there is there is also not only uh, technology, but there is love. There is there is there is there is humanity. We need to create a kind of human connection. But we have and, and in this occasion we start to to, to learn how how to uh, agree together certain solution, to propose solution, to organize, to, to organize um, uh, the, the process in the time, uh, uh, and, and not just to make one big, meet, big meeting, because what we've done there in one year, it, we hope it will go on for the future, because the, we have made a group of, uh, of association I can, can say association of association, hmm? okay? In the way that they, they, because you cannot pretend that the person, even if the most intelligent, more, more aware of, of it can, uh, as, as an individual, can make, uh, take any decision. We, the decision can be done with, with, with the other, with the other. So in this case, in this way, we, we, we don't go, what we did is it was not to go against the politic it was it was to go with the politic that i i mean that for example the mayor that is uh, that is uh, alain juppé uh, that is uh, it's a right person person from the right and uh, um, from the right party um, and everybody was asking to me but how, how it's possible or, or also in the interview what, what is possible that somebody that is from the right is promoting something so left, left as, as it is your pro project? It is because he's an intelligent man, because, because he, can, he can help himself to be, uh, to, to be uh, in, 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 re in relation with the, with the society in a way that he, he, will, uh, he will gain more and society will gain more. <laughs> So this is something we have to find, to understand that we have not, to, not only to be against, but we can gain all together, also from, from, from different points of the, of, the, of the dimension uh, of where we are. Thanks a lot. <laughs> so we will have all three speakers intervene and then come to the questions and discussions. So now we will move on to David Ebrocki's input. So good morning together. It is an honor to be here. I don't speak as free as Mr. Mokus in this morning. My performance will be within my very strong pronunciation. I hope you can follow me and understand. So Barbara Unmusik spoke in this morning about complexity. Yes, the main question of sustainability is, sorry. The main question of sustainability is how to deal with complexity, considering that the human being is a limited one. A limited one, especially in comparison with the whole complexity. We cannot control everything. We cannot understand everything because we are physically and cognitively limited. We feel our own limits when we are overtaxed, for example. 
social and environmental crisis show us that the chosen way to deal with environmental complexity isn't the good one. Two examples. So I'm a lecturer in the university, and when I begin my seminars, I show very often this documentary of the French-German broadcast Arte. The title, Summer 1939. The central question of this documentary is, how did ordinary people behave in the time shortly before the Second World War started? The answers, a lot of ordinary people in Europe simply made holiday. They sunned on the beaches of the Côte d'Azur or at the Baltic Sea, while 60 million people were going to be killed. How is it possible? My second example, when the financial crisis began in September 2008, many people were surprised. They didn't expect it. But was the financial crisis really so suddenly? If we look in the years before, in the time before the beginning of the crisis, we can find of a lot of warn warning signs. For example, there's, there's publications. If you look in the media, in the newspaper of the time before the financial crisis, you can find a lot of articles about the danger of a coming financial crisis. So the experts, the people, knew that a bad crisis was coming, but no investment bank changed their own behavior. No government took measures to avoid the coming crisis. We see it, the so-called knowledge and information society isn't really more sustainable than other ones. So what can we learn from such examples? No social or no environmental crisis comes suddenly. But a crisis comes only when we don't percept its previous warning signs. Every crisis is the result of a growing gap between reality and perception of reality. In the past, we learned mainly after the catastrophe, after the crisis. But in the case of the climate change, for example, it won't be possible to learn after the climate change. It would be too late. So in this century, we have a special cultural challenge because we have to learn, to learn before the experience, to learn a priori instead a posteriori. It is a cultural ch challenge. And if you want this cultural change before the catastrophe, we should ask first what hinders and what promotes the perception of reality. What hinders and what promotes a perception of the warning signs of the crisis. And the last point, people don't always do what they knew, what they know. So rational knowledge isn't a sufficient condition for the perception of reality and for a sustainable behavior. The German philosopher Wolfgang Welsch makes an important distinction, namely between aesthetics and anesthetics. The aesthetic is what we need for perceiving the environmental reality, what we need for to prevent so social crisis, what we need for sustainability. The antonym, the opposite of aesthetic, is anesthetic, and it means to lose the contact to the environmental reality. So we know it in a state of anesthesia, uh, we, don't, we cannot feel the environment, uh, also the inner environment. 
So it is anesthesia. Aesthetic means connection to the environmental reality, and anesthetic means disconnection. So pay attention, please. Uh, I so say it, there is not only an external environmental reality, but also an inner one. Mr. Pistoletto has spoken, for example, about spirit spirituality. So what about art? Can art help us to maintain people awake? In my opinion, arts can promote the perception of environmental reality, but also inhibit it. About the art as an aesthetic factor. So first I mean the art as part of the oak culture, of the eye cult culture, of the advanced civilization. I mean the Western culture, the modernity. The Western culture has three characteristics. The first one is the Cartesian separation between nature and culture, between object and subject. It is not only a separation, but it is also a relationship of dominance. So it is the dominance of the human being on the nature, of the Western culture, on other cultures of modernity, on traditions, but also of the centers, on the peripheries, of the social system, on the environment. The third characteristic is the separation of individuals and community. That is represented, for example, in the demand of total autonomy of the artist. But I don't want to idealize the community. In the Western society, the idea of community was basic, basically designed by Thomas Hobbes. This kind of community is a big machine in that the individuals are uh, are only a cook. So the question isn't individual, individualism or commu communitarism, but the awareness of the connection uh, in between. Arts as an aesthetic factor are on, uh, aren't only part of the Western art culture but they have been a medium of the cultural colonialism, of the cultural modernization, and of the cultural globalization, too. Art can be a status symbol, an investment, an, or the exclusive distinguished mark of the creative class. I'm thinking about uh, uh, Richard Florida. This kind of art support a social inequality, and social inequality inhibits the free communication, for example, the free communication among creative people and not creative people. The typical space for such kind of art is, of course, the temple, the museum, and the art gallery. Instead, the aesthetic art are in the public space, better we are in this morning in the common space. So another point, sometimes people think that the problem of the sustainable, uh, of the discourse about sustainability, is that it is only about catastrophes and negative things. So these people think we need arts in this discourse for making sustainability to a pleasure, to a good feeling. The danger of this strategy is, of course, to conserve people in a state of anesthesia, instead of wakening them in front of the signs of the coming crisis. So the gravitation point of an aesthetic art is the idea for example, the creative idea of the artist. 
the word, the nature, is only raw material that has first to be designed into the same form of the given idea, forgetting any worth. The program of the modernity is a total design of the world into the form of the dominant world view. An aesthetic art, an aesthetic art does the opposite. It doesn't adapt the reality to the idea, but the idea, the conviction, the world view to the environmental reality. The gravitation point of an aesthetic art is the environmental reality, the ecological environment and the inner environment, the cultural environment, the alien. In this case, the arts produce first natural mutation, sorry, sorry. in this case, the arts produce the first cultural mutation that a cultural evolution needs. For example, a poet change, change the code of the language so that the language can grasp the ungraspable in our inner environment. I say that irrational knowledge isn't a sufficient condition to percept the environmental reality. The iceberg model of the psychology confirms this thesis. What does this model tell us? The main part of the communication and of the behavior of, hum of humans is based on subconscious emotion and feelings, and not on the conscious rational way of thinking. Nevertheless, in the Western culture, the rationality has an higher status in consideration than emotion and feelings. Controllable quantities has a better status in our culture than FTSE qualities. The verbal, the digital communication has a better status than the non-verbal, analog communication. So if the psychology is right, I'm finishing. Okay, thank you. So if the psychology is right, then we need a reevaluation of emotions, of feelings, and of the non-verbal languages in our society. It means also a revaluation re of the arts because, in my opinion, the special ability of arts in comparison to science is to communicate on this level, the most important one. So, I haven't a lot of time, but arts as aesthetic factor, very quickly, arts kept can promote the communication with the external and inner environment. And it means to contaminate each other instead of remaining poor. This kind of art means plurality instead of an universal monoculture. Aesthetic art is also a laboratory for possible realities, for experiments, social and cultural experiments. And, sorry, a sustainable art can be more unpleasant than beautiful because it shows us what we, what we usually don't like to see, the alien, and I mean also the alien in ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Davide. So now the floor is to Shelley. Do you want me to, do you want the screen maybe to, to be Hello? back to the... Should we put it off? Um, greetings everyone. I'm very glad to be here and I'm going to try and talk very short so that there's um, sufficient time for some conversation, exchange, dialogue. Um, I might just stop halfway and 
come to my last sentence, so I leave some time. But before I begin, I just want to say, and I mentioned it yesterday when we were working with the artists from many countries, that for me it's very significant that this happens here in the Heinrich Böll house. Um, partly relates to my background. I worked with Joseph Boyce for many years, and if Joseph Boyce had not had the support of people also like Heinrich Böll, who shared his ideas, the ideas that I have worked with for so many years, trying to find forms of reality for, uh, uh, specifically the forms that we were developing in the Free International University, wouldn't really have been possible because there was a cluster of people in the late 60s and the early 70s, the people who also became the founders of the Green Party, and Heinrich Böll worked closely with Joseph Boyce, supporting and working together people like Miran, Milan Horacek, people who were here, very central to Heinrich Böll, to make a case for another way to understand a human being and our capacities. So I want what I say to be um, with that acknowledgement and that thanks um, to that grouping of people and the people who carry those ideas forward in the Heinrich Böll Stiftung. I'm really amazed what you try and do on a world level. So, human beings have ideas, aims, goals. We invent things. We move forward to create new things with a purpose with purpose, because we are clever. But if we do this, if we use our freedom of choice and our freedom to create, without seeing the complexity, without seeing the fine connections, we destroy, disturb, poison, fragment, undermine, overwhelm, destabilize the dynamic equilibrium, the inherent flexibility, the self-adjusting capacity of the living ecosystem, of the self-sustaining wholeness that we are part of. This is why systems thinking is so important and so attractive. If we can learn to work more like ecosystems, we will do less damage. If we can stop pushing forward with our aims and objectives, we will be able to allow things to unfold, let things emerge, and not destroy the self-regulating wholeness. But this ecosystem's view that enables us to see the falseness of such solution goal oriented ways of what has been described as egocentrism instead of ecocentrism, often does not give enough attention to the human being. And I think here I'm going to be saying in a, maybe a different way, perhaps a much shorter way, but what both Michelangelo and Davida and I know Sasha in his wonderful essay, I think you should read it if you hadn't, a little plug for him on sustainability has managed to put forward. So this not giving enough attention partly comes about through a systems view which taken in one perspective comes to suggest that things might be better off without the humans. And I want to make a case for the human being and why uh, it's so important to think about the humans. We are certainly the most complicated and challenging of all Earth's creatures, the most dangerous and also the most endangered. Unlike a tree that knows how to be a tree, we have not even begun to learn and to understand how to be fully human. So what a wonderful agenda we have before us. Instead of despairing and being hopeless, when we look at all the disasters that we've created, and they are countless, 
not only can we be so hopeful when we look at the amazing things we've created, because that has happened as well, but we are just at the beginning of what it means to be human. And I want to develop that a little, little bit. So what can be done with this dangerous, interfering being with huge needs and clever solutions? What can we do? Instead of paying less attention to the human being, we must develop the capacities that are potential but not given. The capacities that will enable us to become more creative, responsive participants. And some examples of these, so it doesn't just sound like more big generalizations, would be the capacity to listen. To listen not just to the sounds we hear, but to listen on every level, to listen to the other, to listen to what is other than human being, to listen to what is not myself, and to listen to myself. I am part of this <coughs> web too. To see the capacity to see the interconnectedness, what organs of perception, what senses do we need to still develop, to see the interconnectedness, to see what is not visible. We've got lots of rational arguments. We've got lots of wonderful science that now shows us how to understand those interconnections. But how can we actually live them in ourselves to the point that we can, as Bertolt Brecht said, become internally mobilized? How can we, how can a movement start from every one of us? That's where movements move from. They move from people, not from outside. So how can we become convinced enough, mobilized enough, what sense organs, what organs of perception do we need to develop to really see the interconnections so we can also see, feel, hear the agony? Another example of what we still need to develop, can be developed, is empathy. And that's nothing new I'm saying. People have been talking about it for centuries. But if you just think of a newborn child, a tree, to go back to my example, a tree knows how to be a tree. A tree doesn't need <coughs> to develop organs and, and uh, forms and modalities that it hasn't already got inherent and that won't unfold by themselves if not left in, if left in an un poisoned, undamaged situation. But a human child won't develop empathy. It won't develop conscience if we don't bring it into an environment, if we don't love it, if we don't become the models for empathy and love and care. So human beings are always just at the beginning with every birth, and in a way, we're at our birth as a whole as human beings. So I find that inspiring. These examples of organs of perception and senses yet to be developed um, include one sense that is perhaps the most difficult to talk about um, in a kind of ecological or environmental or systems thinking way, and that's what I would describe, and other people, including Joseph Boyce, have described before me. I think Schiller was really talking about as well in his aesthetic education of the human being, but I think one could describe as the I sense, in German the Ich Sinn. And when you hear it immediately, it sounds like this must be more egocentrism. But how that I sense is really understood is that unless I can get a sense of myself, be in dialogue with myself, begin to respect myself, what I'm born with, I cannot even begin to recognize and see and respect the being of another. Even more difficult, the being of a non-human being. So all the arguments and debates, perhaps about genetic modification and etc., maybe they'd fall away if we could feel the dignity and the wholeness and the integrity of every other being, from the little creature that clings onto the rock to the non-visible entities that are in the sea and in the sky. So one of the things I really want to emphasize is this eye sense. And now I'm going to fast forward so that there's 15 minutes for discussion. 
And just say that developing capacities like this is part of the field of social sculpture. Social sculpture is, one could also say, the field of transformative practice, of connective aesthetics, which Davida and, in other words, uh, Michelangelo has also talked about, of connective practice. We need to recognize that there is only one field of transformation and no one is outside. And all the methods that we develop in our programs, I work closely with my colleague here, Hildegard Kurt, and a number of other people. We work to develop ways and means and forms, but not as tools, not as formulae, not as kits, toolboxes, but actually to try and help people understand the principles, the understanding, so that they can develop the particular forms themselves. So we offer certain forms, we offer certain ways, but it's important to come to the understandings and there often obviously isn't a second to get there. I just want to end, so, so just to say our projects, our teaching, our pedagogy, if one can call it that, it's much more an exchange. Even our teaching is an exchange, it's not a, a set of practices that tell people our writings, Hildegard writes a lot more than I do. I also write. We all write and speak and think. Um, I want to say two last things. The one is about, and maybe that's a point for discussion, I'll just touch on. In our work, certainly in my work, I find it very dangerous to polarize thinking and feeling. For me, thinking, unless it is really verkopft and abstract and disconnected is actually, if, it's, if we are thinking properly, it's also an experiential form of knowing. And so feeling can be just as disconnecting if there's too much emotion. Um, I won't go into it now, but just to say it's very, I think, very important not to see thinking as necessarily the other of a connected understanding. Thinking properly thought um, is a connective practice. It's one of the ways of working with the invisible materials of speech, discussion, and thought. Um, I think I'm going to end with something because it's so canny, uncanny, that it's so similar to things Davida said, and in other ways Michelangelo, about aesthetics and anesthetics. In 1998, I was asked by the UNESCO Summit for Culture and Development to give a talk on social sculpture in Stockholm to <coughs> cultural ministers and whatever. And at the time, I've never read this text by Walsh, um, I came up with a formulation. I realized, looking back at the original meaning of aesthetics, that if one saw aesthetics in contrast to anesthetics, so it's not bad, you hearing this twice, if anesthetic means numbness and aesthetic is its opposite, we can take it to mean enlivened being and perhaps then anything that enlivens our being um, can be understood to be a new form of a new understanding, a reclaiming, a redefinition of the aesthetic, of aesthetic practice. And if you've got a definition, and this is the bit I'm adding now, in a way David has already said that, but if you have a definition like that, an understanding like that of the aesthetic, you can also start to see the direct link between aesthetics and responsibility. If aesthetics enlivens our potential to see into, to live into, to live the interconnections, then um, the link between responsibility, especially if we take this beautiful English word, I'm sure in other languages it has other uh, emphases, but in English the word responsibility actually includes the ability to respond. And if we turn that word around and look at everything that enlivens our being as enabling, increasing, developing our ability to respond, we no longer have to think of responsibility as a duty, as a moral imperative put on us from the outside, we can begin in every one of our practices, in each of our daily lives, in all the things we do, to look at how can we come, become more connected, more enlivened, more responsible. And there are a myriad of practices we still 
come to need to develop. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Shelley. <coughs> I will have just two questions myself so that there will be enough time for you to ask further questions or make further, uh, give us further insights. The first one will be, let's say, there are three questions. Uh, yeah, well, the first two questions will be to Shelley and to Michelangelo, and the third one to Davide. Um, so, uh, for the two of you together, I mean, you can both reply. If you want to make a, a choir, why not? So, the first question will be relatively sociological. I ha there is a, a sociologist in France called Bernard Lahire, who, uh, Lahire, well, he, he's um, looking into the people's habitus, their dispositions, the way they are disposed, so to say, to, to act or think in certain ways. And in one of his works, his, uh, or in, in his work in general, he's making a clear so to say, um, he's paying attention to the distinction between dispositions to, to believe and dispositions to act. And uh, discussing the fact that at least in our modern society, there are frequent uh, discrepancies, differences between our dispositions to believe and our dispositions to act. And I would like to know how um, the kind of work, the kind of uh, art or transversal activities, practices that you are uh, um, working on, how they can address that issue of the dispositions to act also, uh, and addressing them and not only the dispositions to believe. Okay, um, well, that's not a person I've ever heard of, and they're not two phrases I would normally think in, but I do think about our disposition to act and what hinders our disposition to act, and I would imagine the dispositions to believe are some of the things that affect that. Um, in my own practice and some of the other people in the field, it's actually quite central what we are trying to do is to get right, you could say, down to the habit level. That was a phrase that a teacher from India, Indian philosophy teacher of mine had used, that we have to get right down to the habit level. And it's not something foreign to people who've been involved in any kind of spiritual practices. We actually have to get down to the habit level, to this invisible material, this invisible substance that actually we can't see, we can't measure, but we know has an enormous effect on everything we do. It's our value system, our way of seeing the world. And to actually get to first become aware of it, to learn to see what I see, to see what I think, to hear what I hear, so that we actually become reflective, that we can see these habits, we can see these beliefs, we can see these, uh, uh, this invisible territory. We have to learn to make contact with it, and then we can begin to work with it. So just very briefly, one of the processes I work with with people, a social sculpture practice, is about coming to find your questions, it's just one of the practices, getting into the questions behind the questions. So one's already working with powerful formative forces, not the formative forces Paul Clay was working with, he also used that term, he was working with lines and forms that were externally visible, but I am trying to work together with people with the internal forces and to see where we can shift them, how they look, how they can, because questions, if you find them, the questions hiding inside the questions, you're finding the trajectories, the forces. It's just like being a sculptor, and that's why we can talk about social sculpture. You can find the forces, follow the forces in the questions, and actually allow the answers to unfold. So I hope that wasn't too uh, convoluted or far away from your question, but 
really that we have to get into the subtle material, this very fluid, flexible field that a human being is in order to shift how we might act. We have got the power, the freedom to actually, we aren't trapped in our dispositions. <coughs> believing, thank you. <laughs> believing, believing, and believing and, and acting, no? That was the question. Uh, I was, um, I was in, a, in a talk where they uh, were asking, do you believe? That it, there was a person uh, that was, uh, they took your, your position now. Do you believe? He said, but when you say you believe, you ask, what, what do you mean? I, if I believe in God? Yes. He said, I don't believe. I think. This is, was my answer. <coughs> Believing, it means to, to accept something that is already given and accept it and, and, uh, and following. And bringing it that, that, that uh, condition in your mind as a possession of your mind. Um, if you think, you, you, you can also talk about that, uh, talk about the possession. Uh, you can talk about everything. You, you, you have to re reconsider the things. And for me, um, and for me um, what I do normally in my, in my work, it is th thinking, uh, bringing also the necessity, the necessity of thinking as, as an emotional uh, instinct of, of looking for, of researching. Hmm? Uh, and and finally and finally, all my work it is a, a very phenomenological activity in order to try to understand what uh, what is around myself, what is close and far from myself, but uh, thinking really considering the things uh, as as a ra in a rational way, but not bringing the rationality away from the emotion. Because when I arrive to understand something. I have a really big emotion. Hmm? Uh, so that, that means that in that case, I can act. If I, if I think, I, I act. I produce new things. If I don't think, I don't produce anything new. Thank you very much. The second question is still for all. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Then I will ask you. Yeah, yeah, we see that. So the second question shortly is like an extension of one of the things that David has said or would have said. Um, <laughs> therefore, the question is, um, how do those, once again, those kind of practices that you have been introducing today, how do they address the risk of themselves becoming exclusive practices, discourses, subsystems, as is very often the case in, in art, in our, our recent history. How do you address that issue? Me? So I want to give one quick example. In May last year, I worked with a group of people who now a team for this process we call Earth Forum that we've developed and they've further developed. And we worked in a dry riverbed in a small town in South Africa. And the people in the process were farmers, so mainly white, all white farmers, as farm workers, all black farm workers, because although it's the new South Africa, things are still pretty much the same in terms of classes and labor and there were unemployed workers and there were also some young people who were maybe drinking a lot, taking drugs, who were normally not, not the people, the farmers or the farm workers would sit at the table with. And we met in a dry river bed and we did this earth forum process. And I can't talk about the process now, Hildegard, and I will share it tomorrow. Um, as in, in, a, in a workshop, but one of the things the process does is within two minutes, every single person at that table 
is equal in the sense of not denying difference. Everybody's still utterly different, but they're equal because we're focusing on their shared amazing human capacities that will also allow them to see the d situation differently. And the two capacities that get focused on without it being a taught process are the space of imagination where we can learn to see what we see and hear what we hear and see what we think and everybody has that space and we mention that before people go out into this process and also the process of active listening where we can really learn and try to see the picture the image each other person has, including our own, without judging. And through that process, it's one example of a process that can be used by anyone, anywhere. And I heard recently, this process has been used in South Africa in the run-up to the climate summit. It was funded partly by British Council and Indalietu. I think June is here from Indalietu. But it was, it's been worked with in villages, it's been worked with, with women's farmers' organizations. We've used it, I've been part of it when it's been used with activist groups. And it is actually a process in which everyone experiences an expanded concept of art. We work with the idea, like I did in the Caribbean with the farmers, that every human being is an artist. Because we make pictures in our mind, because we can picture the reality, we can also begin to change those pictures. We don't need to all paint and sing and dance. That's one kind of artist. The other kind of artist is the new artist who can imagine, who can see how things are, not just dream about the future, see how things are, but also begin to picture from the current reality how could it be different. And so, for me, it's not even a question anymore. That was a question when I was young. I was always thinking, I don't want to make art just for an elite few. I want to work in the world, and I worked in community development, and I worked as an artist. And I kept thinking, there must be a way to unite these, because I'm one person. I do both. And that's been my 35-year struggle, is to try and find ways. I feel, for me, it's not a, a problem anymore, and I can't look at what other people do. There's too much to do. Uh, I can answer from my side that uh, being, if you if you if you prepare and you present and you and you uh, in, and you put uh, in in action and you want the people to follow a principle, you can become really exclusive. Uh, but if the principle uh, is sharing. <laughs> you are not exclusive anymore. So that means that the principles are, are necessary. Um, but you have to find the, the right one. Um, in my work, you're speaking about art, I speak about my art. In my work, I, I've been using the mirror as a tool. And uh, being the mirror enabled to recognize it itself, if because the mirror is always able only to recognize what is in front of him, is, is, a, zero, is, is a zero image without an image that is, is projected in him. So this zero, I, I wanted to divide this, this concept of mathematic zero, and, and, and I divided the mirror into, into parts in order to give the possibility to the mirror to recognize it, itself, possibly. So I had two mirrors. These two mirrors, I started to put these two mirrors on an angle and closing the angle between the two mirrors and, the, the, and they multiply themselves inside until the infinity, when the two mirrors are one in front of the other. From the division of, of zero, you have two. And so we have to calculate that the, the, the multiplication is, is, it comes from the division. From two, you, 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 you are in the reflection, million and million of mirrors until the infinity. So you can say also that the, the, the biological structure is, is, is works in the same way. You have a cell and you divide the cell and the, and, and the division of the cell produces the cell that are divided and, they, and the body is growing. So the, 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 the mirror is virtual and the cell is physical, but the, the process is, is equal. Um, so, that means, that means that the principle is not the multiplication, 
but it's the division. If you don't divide, you don't have the multiplication. We live in a world where the principle is conceived to be the multiplication. And the multiplication what it means to, it brings to what? To, to accumulate and exclude. The division in Italian, it can be translated in a social way from divisione to condivisione. Condivisione, it means to divide, divide with. So, in English it's sharing, and we go back to word, the principle of sharing. Thanks a lot. So my last very short question, because I still want to give also chances, other, uh, give other chances to ask. So to, to David, very shortly, I, I will just uh, not really ask you a question, but ask you how satisfied you are with their uh, last two answers. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the word of ambivalence is also because uh, um, the um, Adorno believed that uh, a good life in the false in the false life is not possible. So uh, the challenge is uh, the awareness, so the, the reality that we are part of the same system, of the same culture. We would like to change, and this culture, this system is also a part of us. So, and it is uh, our own ambivalence. It is uh, uh, because uh, it is the, the, the motive why we need a reflexivity and not a, a designing of the object outside of us. We are, we, we, we are self the object also of this change. And uh, uh, ambivalence is not negative, but ambivalence uh, is also, can be also tension and tension is needed for energy, for movement, and for inspiration. So ambivalence is ambivalence. If we, are re if we were reflexive, can become also a tension, and energy, and, and an inspiration for us. So, thanks a lot. Uh, there's a microphone. <coughs> Sorry, that is circulating, so please, now is interaction time. Thank you. Thank you, um, panel, very, very much, and thank you, Sasha, too. Um, I, I was particularly interested in uh, the notion of beliefs um, and the way um, Shelley and Michelangelo were talking about beliefs. Um, I have a problem with beliefs and belief systems, particularly when beliefs become dogma. Um, and that leads me on to the notion of the dogma of learning, too. And Shelley again touched on the notion of questions. Um, in my personal practice as a, uh, an educationalist, um, I've found that the biggest problem that I've come across is problem-based learning. And the number of disciplines that um, invest in a belief system of solution-led, problem-based learning as being the way to solve the crisis that we currently face. Um, as Shelley I started to open up the notion of questions, questioning, I believe, is a, um, a much better way of approaching these situations. And perhaps, as uh, two friends of mine, uh, Helen Mayer Harrison and Newton Harrison, talk about the ennobling problem or the ennobling question as being a way in which all disciplines can come together to address the crises. I believe this is a way of addressing the problem of belief systems. Not a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, maybe, we right. can, maybe we can collect a few, a few inputs from your side and then mm -hmm. we'll ask our speakers to, to close the session. 
maybe you could, uh, Shelley, you could explain um, the no, uh, your idea about iSense a little bit more because I was always thinking iSense because I was believing that we are too human centric in our thoughts and um, I, found I found it interesting that you said that we are only at the beginning of un understanding ourselves so um, yeah, maybe you could deepen that a little. Thanks. Thanks. Is there any other question or input before we ask Shelley to reply to our last question? Um, I have a question as well. I mean, I mean, in my last years, I've been following the climate change negotiations, working with indigenous organizations. So basically, from the side of communities that are trying to instill a new way of looking at global problems, you know, introducing also the element of spirituality. And the last conference in Durban, I was in a meeting with social movements, the alternative summit, and we were looking at each other, and the social movements themselves find themselves confronted with a moment of serious crisis, because there is no chance of changing the paradigm, the official paradigm. So the problem I have now, listening to our discussions, and I feel strongly that the, this is the way to go. It's a question of time. I mean, we are trying to reclaim aesthetics, to re re reclaim a relationship with space, where we are, with the concept of common responsibility towards the common good, towards the planet. But time is running out, so, uh, especially on climate change. So the question is, I guess I like the concept of ambivalence. I mean, we are looking to, into a process that is about, that takes time for individuals and collectivities, communities, to reclaim this sense of responsibility. The time is running out. So this is also an ambivalent process I'm, 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 I'm looking at. So this is why I think this needs to be distilled into common practices as well, into uh, create, arts and culture can create bridges and linkages among different subjects, stakeholders or rights holders or whatever, private sector, uh, local communities, authorities, <laughs> scientists, artists, activists. How can this be done? Okay, one, one last question, uh, Inza. Uh, or is there anybody else? No, okay, so what, what, one last from Inza and then we will ask our speakers to, to close. Oh, someone else also? No, no, Inza, yeah, that's yeah, what I just, okay. yeah. But, yeah. Um, I would like to say something to David's uh, formulation of reality, uh, aesthetics and uh, high culture. I think these three words opening a very wide uh, possibility to answer. So if I go uh, into communication with people and if I talk about reality, I think it's not really a good word to come into action, so to answer the possibility to uh, between belief and action, so I would uh, more talk about being, so the being, the reality of a being. And for aesthetics, uh, the question of aesthetics and non-aesthetics is a big field if you uh, talk about uh, uh, even uh, ecological new uh, investigations in our landscape or something. So I would um, more talk about what is the beauty, I mean the personal beauty on, on the perspective of uh, being, and then the la the next word high culture is also something which is I think in this world now we cannot talk about high culture because we are we we, we try to relate to uh, something else and I would then say living so this is maybe uh, an answer also to the question of this ich ich uh, f uh, coming to know the the ego in a in a personal way that's my understanding of your panel. Thank you very much. Um, so I would like to ask each of you, I will start with Davide and then go to, I mean, just in line, to, to give some last words, last reaction to what was just said. So about the question, the time uh, is running. Uh, I think the first, uh, so the, the um, hope we have in culture is, for example, the perestroika. 
the perestroika was a kind of cultural uh, revolution. And we have uh, two possibilities, so a cultural change or a conflict. So, and uh, now after the perestroika, after the um, conference in Rio, it was after the perestroika, and in, the, in that conference there was the big hope of the possibility of a, a peaceful change of the world. If the time is running, we, go, we are going to the other possibility, not a cultural change, but a growing possibility of conflicts. And we saw in the last years that these possibilities become more and more uh, stronger. Yes. So culture, cultural change or conflict. And we can choose. Um, I just want to s uh, respond to you about the climate summits and the crisis and the urgency and to say that if I only were to work on one level or if I only saw one kind of work, it would be ridiculous. I think the other thing that systems thinking or ecosystems show us is the absolute diversity of levels. And if I can't work on 50 different ways or five different ways myself, then I know that many of my colleagues and brothers and sisters can. And my job is to see the interfaces between the different ways of working. However, I think it's also possible to work on several different levels. So that's the one answer. The second part of the answer is, Recently, I was told that there's a big um, international master's program training environmental decision makers. And I was shocked to hear that in the second semester, they're using one of my old projects with banana farmers, which is about connective aesthetics as part of this training for environmental decision makers, and that they want to now use and develop this earth forum process for environmental decision makers. So yes, that's all too slow and it's all too little, but all these myriad amazing movements where everybody, so many millions of people are realizing things have got to change. We've got to start working with ourselves, with each other, with movements, with policy makers. With I think it's a whole field. And the reason these summits look so hopeless is because they focus everything on one type of uh, process when you actually see the millions of organizations that are all working at grassroots level all the time. Things are changing, even if the big summits are not yet managing. But they w the next summit will go a little bit further, or the disaster will be bigger, and then people will get more frustrated. So the movement and movements are so alive. It's amazing, even if the summits still at that level aren't working. And I think the Ichsen, everyone will get much too hungry if one starts to talk about that now. So I'm happy to talk with any group of people about that um, later. But it's the opposite of egocentrism. It's about learning to recognize the being of another. And for that, we need a special sense. It's a real kind of consciousness. We don't just recognize it when we're born. Before to say good appetite, I, I, I want just to say that um, uh, finally uh, we can have in the uh, anesthetic system of, of the museums, uh, galleries, and even the uh, individual atelier, individual studio, a system um, uh, that, that is uh, anesthetic. But in the, in the museums, we have been worse, always also working with galleries and so on. There is also the aesthetic. So we don't have, we don't, in the anesthetic of the museum, we have also the aesthetic. And it is why I, I, I appreciate the aesthetic side of the museum. Um, um, the capacity of, of preserve something that has been very important in a certain moment, and we can read again. This is, is something. Um, but. Uh, it is why, um, it's, uh, and, and the same thing, I think, we can, it can be conceived in the belief. In the belief, uh, there is, uh, also in the religions, there is a good reason from, from the surgeon of, the, of this belief, but after the belief, it, it, be, it, be end, it become a cage. 
it becomes anesthetic. And you, and, and, and you don't think anymore, and you don't feel anymore. You feel the way to, to, be, to be sure, to, to, no, to conceive that you, bel that you feel, but you, feel, you don't feel uh, uh, really. You don't feel what has been decided to feel. This is, this is some. And the same thing is for the political situation. If we think that Mussolini it was a socialist, uh, he <laughs> became, became a dictator. Um, so, 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 social, uh, Hitler, what was it, social? National socialism. Uh, and Marx was working for social, and 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 uh, and the communism uh, uh, it became a dictator. So it, it happened always the same thing. But it doesn't mean that in the in, in the in the <laughs> in the in, in the politic it doesn't it doesn't exist in the politic uh, uh, it doesn't exist a good a good point in the art it doesn't exist a good point. A, 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 good, a good origin, a good necessity eh, of transformation. The transformation is always being transformed, <laughs> going back. And this, is, this is what we have to know. We have to learn from that, and we have to, to stop to, to see socialism to become dictator. Thanks a lot for your interventions. Thanks a lot to the audience. Before uh, I release all of you to go have lunch, I would just like to know if Gianluca Bocchi is in the room. No. Okay. Um, I want to say one quick thing. I just want to thank Sasha and Heike, and I know David was also involved in it, but really in convening the strand, because people like us don't often get the opportunity to talk about these ideas in these kind of conferences, they're just a bit too on the edge. And it's a pity we haven't got time because I think everybody in this room is probably a practitioner, working, questioning, that we haven't got time to talk more about this, but it's a great opportunity and thank you for all your hard work in 